If you don't want to run around Washington, you can take the Tourmobile. It's one of those hop-on, hop-off services. The ticket's good for 24 hours. And you get some narration along the way. And it stops at all of the major museums and monuments in D.C. It's a real handy way to get around. It'll help you learn more about the history of the city. Washington was founded by our founding fathers. Back after the revolution, there was this uh, big debate as to where the capital of the country should be. And we've already seen that the first capital was in New York City. And then the capital moved to Philadelphia. And both of those cities wanted the capital to be there on a permanent basis. Because, of course, it would have had a tremendous economic benefit to them to have the nation's capital in, the, in your city. So they were offering all kinds of money and land uh, grants to encourage the federal government to settle there. But the government wanted a more central location and they wanted more land. So they chose this region. And this is the founding father still. George Washington played an active role in choosing the site and so did Thomas Jefferson. And it was kind of a compromise. It's midway between the north and the south and they were able to get some concessions from the large landowners here. Uh, a lot of this was just swamp land, so nobody really cared much about it. The Jefferson Memorial. Once again, we see the Pantheon from Rome. And well, you can tell with the, the big dome and the columns and the rounded structure. And when we get inside there, you're gonna see how awesome it is with the big statue. It's about 39 feet tall. And there's a lot of the writings of Jefferson carved on the wall, parts of the Declaration of Independence. He was a graduate of the College of William and Mary, and he was trained in law. And he worked as a lawyer in the colony of Virginia for about six years. And he was very successful, of course, very intelligent. And then he became elected to the Virginia House of Burgesses. That was a colonial institution. This is while we were still connected to England, the House of Burgesses. So it was kind of like a legislature, right? even though we were still controlled by England. So this was an experiment, in a sense, at self-government. And it was happening in Virginia, which was playing a real leadership role. We've heard a lot about Boston and New York and Philadelphia so far in our travels. But important things were also going on down in Virginia. And Virginia was not just what we look at today as the state of Virginia. It was a larger territory. It included West Virginia, Kentucky, a big, big chunk of land. Almost the southern part of the United States, southern part of America. So he was a very popular man, well known. And um, then he was elected to the first, or selected to go to the first Continental Congress. And we remember up in Philadelphia, we saw that was at Carpenter's Hall, the First Continental Congress. That was 1775. And that was a brief meeting, and it didn't come to much. And then a year later, he was sent back to Philadelphia to be a member of the Second Continental Congress. And that was the one that was the really decisive moment when they came to the conclusion that America should and ought to be uh, free and independent states. So he was there at the creation. And then he was assigned uh, the task, along with five other people, four other people, to write a defining document that would summarize and crystallize all of their thoughts. And this was to become the Declaration of Independence. So this committee of five people started working on the document, and they, the rest of them said, well, Thomas, you've got the best ideas. Why don't you just write it by yourself? And so he went off to that boarding house that we saw in Philadelphia and sat down for uh, just a few days. And in one of the most creative outputs in the history of politics or literature, came up with the Declaration. And it was adopted pretty much as he wrote it. Uh, there were changes, something like 20% was chopped out um, in the committees and all but uh, pretty much as he wrote this document, and it was adopted, and of course up here on the wall you see some of the excerpts from the Declaration. It's such a, a marvelous statement. He had already written several other books, uh, Notes on the State of Virginia, uh, was a very important book, so he already had a reputation as a scholar, even before that happened. 
So what a great man. Downstairs in what had been an unutilized basement, they've created a brand new museum about Jefferson. And it's very informative. It's packed with history. There's photographs, paintings. There's a lot of things to read. There's a couple of short movies that you can have a look at. Don't miss it. From the Jefferson Memorial, we'll next go to the FDR Memorial. Let me just go back out to the road and catch our tourmobile. The tourmobiles come on a regular schedule every 15 minutes during the season, so it's a convenient way to get from one memorial to the next. Over to your right, just past those trees, is where you're going to find the FDR Memorial, dedicated to 32nd President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now, the memorial consists of four outdoor chambers. The FDR Memorial is the most recent monument to be built in Washington, and it's very impressive. There's signs of the Great Depression here. So there's a nice statue, beautiful large bronze statue of FDR, showing him in a very warm pose, looking out at you. And there's his dog, Fala. Another of the many elements you'll find here is a statue of Eleanor, which is probably the most prominent homage to a first lady that you'll find in our nation's capital. And it's most appropriate since Eleanor Roosevelt was probably the first activist first lady. A lot of water features here, since it's right next to the tidal basin, fits in nicely. And it harkens back to Roosevelt's time as secretary of the Navy. His four freedoms are etched in stone. And then for a quick change of pace, we're going across town, leaving the memorials, heading into downtown Washington, and give you a quick look inside the Discovery Channel store. This is a cross between a museum and just a fun shop. It's got all kinds of scientific toys. It's got games. It's got clothing and furniture, artworks, a lot of really high quality stuff inside the Discovery store. It's actually a chain of shops that you'll find in some of the major cities in America. It's operated by the same corporation that runs the Discovery Channel, so there's a real emphasis here on education and science and learning, and it's good for children of all ages, as they like to say. It's located right in the heart of downtown Washington. Yes, there really is a downtown Washington, and there is a fair number of restaurants that you'll find here. Frankly, uh, tourists don't come over to this part of town very often, but it is worth your while. It's near the new MCI Center, and you'll find this Mexican restaurant, Haleo, and it was quite tasty. Get your salsa and chips, and then hop into the metro and zip away across town back to our hotel. It's the next morning now, time for breakfast and the start of another day. The L'Enfant Plaza is just near our hotel. It's a big complex with shops and offices and a major metro station as well. So we pop in here, have a quick look around on our way to the Holiday Inn Capital. This is our base for four nights in Washington. It's located just two blocks from the mall and the Air and Space Museum. So it's a really convenient location for seeing things. And then a quick hop yep. over to Georgetown. Okay, so we're gonna go take a little walk around Georgetown. We're gonna go two blocks down N Street. These are row houses, and they call these, um, this is from the federal period of architecture. And most of them were built in the early 1800s in this neighborhood. And you know, Georgetown is the oldest part of the region. It's older than Washington, D.C. Hey, it leaves there. Mm -hmm. Wisconsin, the main commercial drag. There's shops that go up for about a mile here. So all the shops are open. So this is the famous canal of Georgetown. It's called the, the C&O Canal, Chesapeake in Ohio. And it was built in 1828. And the reason was for commerce. They were trying to encourage the development of Georgetown and also expansion into the eastern hinterlands. 
So they went to a lot of expense and they dug this canal in 1828, 1830, but the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad opened up at the same time. So it's the same story that we find in Western Europe too. The early 1800s was a time of canal building in England and in France before there was any railroads. And all of a sudden a locomotive was invented and it made them all obsolete just when they got finished digging them. Instantly obsolete. So this was abandoned and overgrown and only in recent years it's been renovated as a historic site. Some lovely old historic buildings along the canal too. They've been turned into restaurants, takeout places, Chinese, Japanese. So they still have locks here. It's still functioning as a real canal. This is nice, getting right down at the edge of the canal. Oh, it's like we're transported back in time here. Our tour is winding down to a you. close. Hope you've enjoyed the whole visit and now it's time to reflect back upon our East Coast tour. And we had a wonderful time, had wonderful meals, saw a lot of history. So far I think New York has been our highlight, going to the shows. Uh, that's been a uh, life, lifestyle achievement for us anyway. <laughs> It is, and even the capital, as it was, you know, all yeah. those, uh, seeing the Hope Diamond and the historical the places, aquarium and all those things. Uh, we enjoyed every bit of it. Yeah. I, I don't think we'll get this opportunity with such a terrific guide we have, the knowledge you have. Oh, I can't get over you, Dennis. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> yeah, we really enjoyed it. We really enjoyed it. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe hope to join you again. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so we get a lot of more trips. Yeah. It's a big world. It is. Really. Thank you. Well, <laughs> the best part of the whole trip was having Dennis as our director. No one has ever been so courteous and, and uh, attentive and helpful in every way. You've made it a real wonderful trip. I'll never thank you enough. Well, Keep us on your list. <laughs> okay. And we say we say aloha. <laughs> right. What were some highlights for you too? Well, everything was so great. I don't know which to say was the best. Um, I, I thought I liked Boston best. Then when I went to New York, I said, "No, New York is my city." Then Philadelphia was most educational. But Washington, D.C., I think, was the highlight. I learned so much here now, if I can only retain it. <laughs> I have much to tell my friends. Really? Well, you've got and your... I thank you very much. We had a great time with your knowledge. We have seen so much by walking on these cities that hopefully uh, we remember at least half of what we have seen so far uh, to take uh, back with us. We always appreciate the fact that we travel with a group that's uh, small and uh, we love to walk so we feel that the best way to see things is to get out and walk and boy we sure, uh, we sure do a lot of that with you Dennis and that's the best way we think to see things. Uh, it's so much fun traveling between the cities by train and uh, that's part of, makes part of the adventure. And our highlights, I think, were that we stayed in the middle of each city and were able to see things so easily. And uh, at the end, we felt that we got to know each city and uh, uh, felt that the time that you allowed was just right for us to leave each one with the feeling that we really got to know it and feeling it at home in each one. It's aloha to Washington, D.C. You've been watching our tour of the East Coast with the Hawaii Geographic Society.